permutations and combinations help us figure out how many different ways we can do something. Um, they're somewhat related to the fundamental counting principle that we did before, um, but the, they're similar uh, in a lot of ways, but the main difference they have is order. For permutations, order matters. For combinations, order doesn't matter. Um, so for example, if you have, uh, if you're in a race and um, the first place person gets a hundred dollars and the second place person gets fifty dollars and the third place person gets twenty five dollars then the different ways that say ten people running that race can can be ordered for those winning spots the order matters because what first place gets is different from what second place gets and so on so that would be an example of a permutation whereas um, it may be different if uh, you're doing a qualifying heat and you say the top three runners get to move on to the next heat. And in that case, in the race, it really doesn't matter if you're first, second, or third. It just matters that you get in the top three. So that would be an example of a combination. Because whether it's person A, B, and C or person B, C, and then A, all three of them are still going to the race. So um, you can do this in your calculator. I'll show you in just a second. It's uh, these buttons you see here, the NPR and the NCR. We used the NCR before with the binomial theorem, so you may remember where we get to that. Um, but I'm going to do some examples from our book. So if you actually have our book, then you can look there. I'm looking on page 985 at our, in our book at uh, number 17 through 20. So in number 17, it says a medical researcher needs six people to test the effectiveness of an experimental drug. If 13 people have volunteered for the test, how many ways can six people be selected? So first the question is, is this a combination or is this a permutation? Well, it doesn't appear that the order matters. He's just picking a group of six people from 13, so it would just be a combination. So we would set it up this way, 13 in CR6. So 13 choose 6. So we would type in 13, then we go to math, and then over to probability and use the NCR and choose 6. And so we get 170 or well, excuse me 1716 is our answer. All right, oh, sorry. Just spoiled that one. Uh, number 18, it says 50 people purchase raffle tickets. Three winning tickets are selected at random. If the first prize is $1000, second prize is $500, and the third prize is $100, in how many different ways can the prizes be awarded? So this is chosen for 50 people. Now the order here definitely matters uh, because first place gets 1,000, second place gets 500, and third prize gets 100. So this is a permutation, so we would use 50 in PR3 because there are 50 people and we're going to choose three of them but in a specific order. So 50, math, probability, in PR3. So that's 117,600. Okay, so sorry for that delay. Um, let's see, uh, the next question, number 19, says how many different four-letter passwords can be formed from the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G? if no repetition of letters is allowed. So we're forming passwords from the letters A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So we're taking the first seven letters of the alphabet and making four letter passwords. So you have to think, does order matter in this case? Well, yes, absolutely. The password A, B, C, D is not the same password as D, C, B, A. That's the same four letters, but it's not the same password because it's in a different order. So order absolutely matters. So this would be a permutations example. Now, I'm actually writing these the way you plug them in the calculator. These can also just be written as 7P4, because the 7 is your N and the 4 is your R. So if you see it that way in the book or in other places, no, that's the same thing. I'm just writing it the way you would plug it in your calculator. So 7, math, probability, NPR, 4. So 840 possibilities. 840 different passwords.
Alright, and finally, the last example we'll talk about is 50 people purchase raffle tickets. Three winning tickets are selected at random, and each prize is $500. In how many different ways can the prizes be awarded? Alright, so this is an example. This is very similar to our previous one with the raffle, but here it really doesn't matter what order those three winners are, because each winner gets the same thing. So whether your name is drawn first, second, or third, you get the same result. So order does not matter here, so we would use combinations. Now a question I want you to think about for a second, do you expect that this combinations, I mean if you notice, these two have the exact same numbers, it's just that one is permutations and one is combinations. Think for a second, decide, do you think when we plug this in for combinations, will we get a smaller or a larger number than when we did it with permutations. So will combinations turn out to have more possibilities or fewer possibilities? Well, let's plug it in and see, and then we'll talk about why that would be. So 50, math, probability, NCR, 3, we get 19,600. 19,600, so clearly it's much, much smaller. Um, the reason for that is, again, the issue of order. Um, if I choose three people at random, so let's say I choose Tom, Dick, and Jane. Okay, Tom, Dick, and Jane. For combinations, that's it. That's the only combination of Tom, Dick, and Jane that I can have. Because um, it doesn't matter what order I draw them in. If I draw Jane, Dick, and Tom, or Dick, Jane, then Tom, or Tom, Dick, then Jane, all of those are the same combination because it's the same three people. But for permutations, drawing Tom first, Dick second, and Jane third is different from drawing Tom first, Jane second, and Dick third, or any other amount of possibilities. So there's actually even more possibilities just by drawing Tom, Dick, and Jane, because if you draw them in a different order, that's more possibilities. So permutations is going to offer more possibilities than combinations. So if you want more practice with that, anything in your book on page 986 um, from about 33 through 58 would be good practice. The next thing we're going to talk about is just general probability. Our book also calls this, uh, you can use this formula for either um, empirical probability or theoretical probability. Empirical would mean you're getting it from actual data that was taken, and theoretical would just be, like we talked about before, it would be just theoretical. And this is pretty simple. The formula is just the number of times the desired event occurs divided by the number of total possible events. So I have a pretty simple example set up right here. It says, what is the probability of rolling one die and getting a number less than a five? Okay, so whether you figure out the top or the bottom of this fraction first really doesn't matter. Um, let's just do the bottom part first, total possible events. In other words, if you roll one die, one six-sided die, how many different possibilities are there that you get? Well, obviously there's six. You could get one, two, three, four, five, or six. Okay, on top, we want to know the number of ways to get less than a five. Well, there you could get a one, a two, a three, or a four. So there would be four possibilities. You just reduce that fraction, and you find out that there is a two-thirds probability of rolling one die and getting something less than a five. Okay, next example, what is the probability of rolling two dice and their sum equaling four? Okay, we're rolling two dice, so let's think about this. If I roll two dice, there's six different possibilities with the first one and six different possibilities with the second one. So if you use the fundamental counting principle, you do six times six, and you know there are 36 possibilities. So that's going to go on the bottom of our fraction because there are 36 total possible outcomes. Think about it this way. If you roll the first die and it's a 1, then you could pair that with 1 through 6 in the second die. And you do that with all 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, then that's how that works out. So now we need to figure out the probability of rolling two dice and their sum equaling 4. 36 is the total number of possible outcomes of rolling two dice. Now we need to figure out the probability, or excuse me, the number of ways to get a sum of 4. Well, your first die could be a 1 and your second one a 3. You could have them both equal to 2. Or you could have the first one being a 3 and the second one a 1. So there's only three ways that you can get a sum of 4. 1 and 3, 2 and 2, and 3 and 1. 
So if you reduce that, you get 1 12th. So when you roll two dice, there is a 1 in 12 chance of you rolling a sum of 4. Final example. Find the probability of drawing a red face card from a deck of cards. All right. If you're not familiar with cards, there's four suits. There's four suits of 13 cards each for a total of 52. One is hearts, one is diamonds, one is clubs, and one is spades. Hearts and diamonds are red. Clubs and spades are black. So if we call the face cards the jack, the queen, and the king, so there would be a jack, queen, king of hearts, and a jack, queen, king of diamonds that would be red. So that means there are six red face cards out of a total of 52 cards. So we can reduce that answer to 3 over 26. All right, any problems, uh, any practice examples you may want to do would be in page 998. Uh, anything from like 1 through 30 would be good practice.